Um, uh, just a little bit about uh, Mariah before she introduces herself in another way and the people that she's speaking with. Um, Mariah is really one of the founders of the festival. She's been around since the beginning and while her, uh, her role has shifted throughout, she's definitely been in on the ground floor of our conversation. So I think it's important people know that just in terms of as they're getting to know who we are and as we're getting to know who you are, we're all spending so much time together. So. So happy that that's the case. Um, I'm Sarah, um, and uh, and uh, one of the things that we realized after a really terrific launch to the festival with Choir, 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 um, and uh, and a wonderful territorial acknowledgement is that in our rush to do a number of things, we've not put that as part of our practice uh, in introducing the shows. Uh, and so I want to thank. Um, uh, Angela, actually, for, for bringing that up yesterday and reminding us to uh, to think about that and the land that we're on. Uh, we're on Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe territory here. Um, it's unceded, and uh, we're here very much on the uh, on the backs of uh, colonial decisions, colonizing decisions that were made many many years ago, um, and trying to make um, uh, the best guests that we can be. And so, to say uh, that we have forgotten to acknowledge that on a number of occasions is, is part of the work to say, wow, um, that's a, a history of my own um, colonized mind and something that I'm working on constantly to try to come to terms with. So really grateful that, um, that you raised it and, uh, and also to be able to acknowledge the land that we stand on um, and to try to do a good work towards that uh, reparation each day. Um, so today's uh, uh, conversation is totally cash. Those of you who've been here before, hope you're enjoying the breakfast. Hopefully people will be coming in and out. Uh, it is being live streamed, so if the camera moves around, make sure that you're ready for your close-up. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, uh, these chats are an opportunity to have different ways into the conversation. So today's about locative apps. Um, and um, I think I don't need to say anything more other than to turn it over to you. On the roll. Hello. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. That's great. Really great. I'm really happy to be sitting here with Andrew and Tristan. Um, I know Tristan a little bit from his work with a company called Pop Sandbox. I'm just going to ask both of you to kind of give us Cole's notes on who you are, what kind of work you're doing, the work that you both do in Halifax and Toronto. So Tristan, go ahead. Sure. Okay. Hey, everyone. I'm Tristan uh, Tigelman. I work uh, for a producer and do some of uh, the creative direction for uh, Pop Sandbox. We just created... Uh, an app called On Foot, which is uh, self-guided location-based tours that you use a lot of interactive components. We can launch tours anywhere in the world. Uh, it kind of started as a haunted walk app and kind of grew into this larger platform. Um, so we're by the end of the summer, hopefully, we'll have launched uh, six tours in Toronto and one tour in Tokyo. Uh, we use uh, kind of audio stories with images to tell our stories, and then you can discover more. So we offer image galleries. We'll offer uh, VR photospheres to take you inside of buildings. Uh, we do augmented reality, so we can put a ghost on the street in front of you for the haunted tours. Uh, and then, yeah, that's that's kind of our big project right now. We also do other interactive work. Uh, interactive documentaries and we've done a few other things if you're interested in some around the work let me know but our big project is called On Foot uh, yeah I'm Andrew Burke I'm a originally software developer from Halifax and uh, last year I worked on a project with Halifax's Zupa Theatre uh, called This Is Nowhere and uh, it was a multi-location theatre production with lots of little hidden productions happening all performances happening all around downtown and uh, you would use an app to sort of get clues and give you sort of a warm, cold GPS kind of reading on where you were and you sort of scavenger hunt to find these performances and when you got close enough it would sort of switch over and say, you know, find the person with the blue hat, you know, show them your phone and then you'd be in the middle of a performance, possibly at a bar or in a library where nobody else there even knows that there's a show going on because it's just sort of in the space. And uh, I built all the software. There's a lot of server-side management and making sure that you know, sites don't get overloaded with too many people. Uh, we had registration and things like that. There's a content management system, and then I also built the, the mobile apps for that, that that help you get around. And we're spinning that off as its own sort of platform called Now Here, Nowhere, Now Here, uh, to um, to possibly apply to other kinds of projects that have like location and performance and content. So it's very similar in some ways <laughs> to what you're doing, but mostly text. Uh, mm -hmm. We had slightly different focuses. I think ours is uh, as an assistant to a bigger picture production rather than a standalone thing where people go by themselves. So uh, our focus was a bit different. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, we're working. Hopefully, fingers crossed, we're going to put some multiplayer stuff in the future. Cool. <laughs> okay. Multiplayer, what do you yeah. mean? Uh, syncing up uh, the app with other people around you, so you go on group tours. But, uh, nice. yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then maybe one day live performance stuff, we'll see. Right now, it's just <laughs> self-edited tours. <laughs> oh, that's great. Yeah. Cool. 
I have a few questions, but I wanted to open up if anybody has any questions, thoughts that they have uh, right off the bat for Andrew and Tristan. Uh, oh. oh, go ahead. Yeah, we've done um, a, a few, a little bit of work with a group called Lab of Misfits in London. I don't know if you're familiar with them. They did a project called the Virginity Project where users were allowed to, to drop the story of the loss of their virginity. Near where they lost <laughs> oh, man. And then the stories are triggered when you cross the, the GPS uh, marker. Uh, but we had issues with the resolution of GPS yes. for triggering. So, um, you know, if you have any strategies around that, maybe it's not for this discussion. No, no, I think yeah, it's, I think it's, yeah. Yeah, sure, yeah. I have a lot of issues with GPS. I've also asked many people about how to fix it, and it's, I've been told I need access to military satellites. Yeah. Oh, wow. Uh, really? Which costs yeah. extra, unfortunately. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's very <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, our big thing became one, I mean, we, we have multiple haunted tours we're trying to launch, and we were originally going to try and launch our tour around around Young Street in Toronto, and we just realized mm -hmm. you just, the, you could be five blocks off on the GPS yeah. mm -hmm. on where, where your location was, and we were using a software plugin for Unity called Mapbox, and we thought, oh, maybe Google Maps would be better, and we saw Google Maps was just as far off, it was just right. a GPS thing. Um, so tricks are, you know, you, <clears throat> you can kind of play around with the settings so that it's not constantly checking, and then there's, there's little things you can do like that. My, my biggest thing is just try and pick areas where the buildings aren't too tall, um, right. <laughs> and try and base your stories around there. Um, and there's also, uh, the other thing we do is we, especially with our audio, we try and we work in our, our directions a little bit into the audio, so mm -hmm. like, you know, head up this street and those kind of things. You can add in cues of that nature as well. Yeah, ours, we sort of early on realized that, you know, we early on the thought was, oh, we'll, we'll have one of the locations will be this table and the other, other location will be that table that's only like five meters away and that, there was no way. Uh, but we ended up, uh, setting up all these different locations had kind of a radius of about 20 to 30 mm -hmm. meters depending on the or maybe a hundred sometimes and so the we always had a, a differentiation between looking for a place and then being at a place um, and when you got to the place it would then give you more specific instructions like okay look for the green door stuff that you could at least be you're close enough <laughs> uh, you've maybe traveled several hundred meters or you know whatever to get there and then you still got maybe 30 meters 40 meters to go but by then you should be able to see where you need to go and the crews would then give you that but yeah we found that was about as precise as we could get yeah um, we were able to get maybe five meter resolution yeah in areas where the buildings were tall yeah and you can never and everyone's phone's going to be different the actual um device or the thing that people are going to be using so that's yeah. always a bit of a challenge that uh, yeah. that every it's like going you know, putting on a putting on a play but everyone's got a different theater <laughs> yeah. um, you know well, or, that's a good analogy. Yeah. Yeah. some of the theaters refuse to run some of them refuse to run some of them are really old. some of them are those little penny penny uh, you know, um, <laughs> um, but we actually did try doing um, AR stuff for a little while early on for experiments, and there's a, there a library called ARCL, which is a core location of augmented reality. And it, would per, it was a perfect conceptual idea because we were trying to map things, like virtual things, into the real world in positions. But yeah, GPS shifts you 30 meters to the left, mm -hmm. or you know, suddenly everything kind of falls apart. And you've seen the Pokemon Go Death Counter, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What yeah, is this? What's the Pokemon well, Go Death they, Counter? They, they, they shut it down. Okay. Mm -hmm. they, <laughs> But uh, uh, there was a counter up on line that was counting the number of people who walked. Oh, died, oh. crossed off it. That was, yeah, we can talk about yeah. attention as well, but that's, yeah, something else particularly. Yeah, so I just want to ask a really um, naive question. So two thoughts. One is I want to know, thinking about Pokemon Go, because it, I know nothing about the technology, but Pokemon right. Go, the, the, the sites are much closer together, I think. Right. And the other one is, last year at Folda, we saw a show called Ambrose, Okay. And it was, um, we went around the Grand Theater downtown, mm -hmm. and it, I think those were triggered by beacons. Yeah, beacons. We did look so right. How is, what, is the, what is that, and how is oh. that different? Mm -hmm. um, cool. Uh, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll start. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, we've tried to play around with Bluetooth beacons, which are almost like hot cold sensors, and you need to have your Bluetooth on uh, in order to, to pick them up. The thing about them is that it's, it, they're really just hot cold beacons, and they can send a small amount of data. I, we, Originally, we're hoping like, oh, we could use this as a way to like stream assets into the app, but all it really does is trigger that this is the content that you need to grab from this place. Mm -hmm. um, 
but it does work for if you want. That's I know I know stores use it sometimes to like tell you if there's a deal on this T-shirt. Right. It's much better for like museums. Yeah, it's, it, a museum is another oh, yeah. good place to use it, like close proximity um, so that makes location. Ambrose, we just went around the one building. Yeah. yeah. Sort of yeah, inside, and you, the, around the block. Yeah, the beacons are about this big, and you can just stick them somewhere. And as, if you're within a meter or two of it, it mm-hmm. sort of beeps at your phone and says, "Oh, this is the beacon that got an ID." So then you can tie media to the beacon, and it's much more precise. But you got to set them up, and you have to make sure that once again, everybody's devices can handle beacons, which yeah. is not always yeah. a guarantee. Yeah. Once again, and from what I, I remember, they gave us devices. Ah, was it our helps. own devices? Yeah. Maybe, okay. maybe we weren't using our own phone. Yeah, they had a device okay. that was like somehow connected to the beacons right. themselves. It wasn't okay, like a BYO be, phone situation. Yeah. You actually, I think, yeah, they was, gave, yeah. I think they gave us phones. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, ours was several hundred people per show, and we couldn't. We didn't have several hundred phones to give away. <laughs> <laughs> so if you have if you have a venue and you can control the devices and like have a Wi-Fi router, there you, there's so much more you can do. Whereas when you're trying to just do outdoor exploration with whoever whatever random phones they have, it gets a little bit more. I, and one thing I should have mentioned before is we also use pictures of buildings. So if you're 30 meters off on your phone, you'll see a picture and be like, oh, that's the building. That's down the there. I know I gotta walk a couple blocks down, but yeah, we try. What was your first question again? Oh, I just wanted to know about Pokemon Go. I don't know. Oh, that, that was the remember. Uh, yeah, well, Pokemon Go, the one thing about Pokemon Go, I'll say, is uh, they are mu- they're much less site-specific. So it doesn't really matter where the Pokemon is as long as it triggers when you walk up. So you, they, I know they have some of those, the spinning coin things that are tied to certain parks right. and things like that, but in terms of when the Pokemon pop up at you, it's it's more about just walking and having your phone notify you as opposed to saying, oh, I'm in front of the scene. Finding right. this. Yeah, they're not, they're not yeah. within like a three meter radius. Yeah. No, I was thinking about the sites, the, whatever they're called, stops or whatever. Yeah. They're, yeah. Not, they're tied to specifically. Yeah, those are, and I always but find... they fairly big, I think. Yeah, and the thing I was, I'll say, especially about GPS, is like, the, our points on the map are never off. They're always in the right spot on the map. It's where you are that's never correct. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's interesting. Okay. Yeah. Thank, thank you for that. Yeah. <laughs> So Unity, you both spoke about Unity. Mm-hmm. I don't know if this is I'm. Does everybody else know what Unity is? And I'm just the only one who has no idea what Unity is. I don't know. Tell us a little bit about Unity. You both. Told uh, us. I don't. I know of it. You're, you're actually working it. Okay. Yeah, I've worked with Unity a number of times. Uh, Unity is a great, ever-expanding game platform. Uh, so you can build games and launch it to almost any platform. So it allows you to build a video game in Unity and then put it on Steam or put it on PS4 or put it on Android or iOS. And that's, it, that presents its whole other group of challenges, oh, yeah. um, uh, but that's what's so nice about it is that you can kind of launch your, you don't have to build natively, so I don't have to build an iOS app and build an Android app. I, ah, you build it and You build it and then, build it and then you can export it into the two, and then you have to do bug testing because oh, for some reason the Android one's not working the same as the iOS <laughs> yeah. one, but that's, it's still, that's what, that's one of the best benefits about you know, Unity, and there's like a ton of I'll say that there's like a lot of great help stuff online. They have a lot of great plugins for Unity, things like that. I mean, we if we went back, we might not have built in Unity. We originally used it because we wanted to do an augmented reality app, and mm. the augmented augmented reality in our app kind of got scaled back because it became more of a feature than the main point of the app. Mm. Um, and we found building a, a walking tour app is not really a video game. It's almost like a menu system <laughs> that you're going through as you're going, yeah, and that's. Unity is not necessarily built for that, so it was actually quite a, like building an image gallery in, in Unity proved to be a nightmare that we, we pulled off, but it was like surprisingly, you would think like, oh, just build like an image gallery. It's, it was like way harder than if we wanted to build a whole 3D world, so. Yeah, but I mean, we should say for live performance, Unity and Unreal Engine are encouraging mm-hmm. development of different applications for the gaming engine. Right? Mm-hmm. So we've been yeah. using it in performance. And what's great about it is the gaming, uh, folks have figured out the latency problem, you know, where, oh. well, especially when we do live feed in theater, you, know, you always see like this three to five second gap. Right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's not there with Unity or Unreal. Oh, and okay. Unreal's even giving out very large grants actually to people that are using the Unreal Engine in different ways than just made a, uh, like a totally 3D film that the short film they put out that was created in Unity. It was mm-hmm. awesome. Yeah. It looked like an awesome film. Um, yeah. We used, sorry. When you said that you uh, might not have used, like that as you were working with Unity, <coughs> if you were doing it back there. If you were doing it over <laughs> again, based on what you know now, would you still use Unity or would you use something else? I think we we might have built natively just because we, that was the main thing is we just found that 
our app became a lot of many systems, mm -hmm. um, and that, that might have been easier to build in one of the other platforms. Mm -hmm. But also, I mean, going back, we kind of, it just was when we started working on it. Mm -hmm. We kind of wound up having to use Unity, and we wound up having to use all these other plugins because we, we started this project before ARKit and before uh, AR Core came out, which, and the, so we had created our own way of doing AR, and then we're like, oh, we have these new Google and Apple are supporting augmented reality now, so we had to pivot to those. Then we use Mapbox, but if we, because at the time Google Maps didn't work with Unity, and now it does. So like going back, we might use Google Maps as well. So there's just a whole bunch of things that if we had started the project two years later, probably would have been a little. <laughs> we might still update it over. But I used I end up using uh, React Native um, uh, JavaScript basically that then renders down into native iOS and Android and stuff. So it's much better for things like the photo gallery, but it's not as good for like, 3D <laughs> 3D video game type stuff. Uh, but but it was definitely really key because I was the only only software person on this to not have multiple code bases doing completely different. We did some early prototypes as just regular iOS stuff, but it was definitely a big plus to be able to work in a work in a you know write it once and then twiddle with it to get it to mm -hmm. come out to two different things. Yeah. Um, yeah, so cross platform is really a key thing. Yeah, have good yeah. It's, it's, it's amazing. Like yeah. I, we still may have done it, just we would have talked about it more. <laughs> yeah. Charles. Andrew, you mentioned to me in passing that you did like some server side management for accessibility. Yeah. Could you maybe speak mm. to us about that a little bit? And Tristan, I don't know if that's part of your work as well. Mm. Yeah. 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 Um. Because because uh, like I said, sort of project you would be assigned different. You basically, uh, when the show starts, you sign in, you give your code and everything onto the app. It would be checking in with the server to decide where you're going to go. Um, and so everybody ended up getting a different experience. Uh, they'd go to the different locations in a different order. <laughs> Nobody would get to see all of them unless they were super fast, but usually not. Uh, and some locations only had one or two people at a time, and so those were only a handful of people ever got to see it. But what's great is at the end of the show, everyone gathered together at the end of the big finale, and everyone had a totally different experience of what they saw in what order. Um, but what was nice about that is that we could, when people were signing up, we actually had a part of the registration form was optional on the second page. You know, do you have any what's your mobility like, are you fine? And it wasn't just like, I have mobility issues, yes, no, it was sort of a, a drop down menu with various options. Uh, so like, I sometimes get sore, you know, I am, maybe I don't want to like hike across the city 20 times, uh, or all the way down to like, I am in a wheelchair or whatever. And, um, and we had some other thing for hearing and some other thing for vision. And, um, and what was great with, especially for the, for the wayfinding, is that if you'd said that you have some mobility issues, it would actually give you closer locations mm -hmm. to go to. Um, and then we also were able to flag some of the locations on the server side as just because of the way that we, it was tough to get a dozen locations that fit all of our criteria that allowed people coming through. So a few of them just were not going to be accessible for people who couldn't climb stairs, mm -hmm. for example. So those were just discreetly removed from the options for those people. And you never know. Nobody, have, nobody gets to see everything anyway. So it, no, it didn't feel like, oh, well, you can't see the real show. It was just like, these are the options that you get. Uh, so it was nice we were able to use software to provide like a custom experience that didn't feel like you're going off the other way. Yeah. Yesterday when you were talking to me about it, you also said that there was a, within the, the app, that information was then able to go out to sort of the, the yeah. point people, mm -hmm. and, and they were also prepared to support those people each, when they arrived, which I thought was really yeah. kind of great. Each location had a site manager, and we had the software also they had a, like, a little web interface that the site managers could use on the phone that would show who's on their way. Um, how many people are on the way and I had a little map and show where they are. So yeah, it was constantly, the phones were constantly checking back in uh, every, you know, yeah, every few seconds. Um, and so you could see who's, how long they've been on their way. So if they seem to, it looks like, looks like they're lost, we can, you know, text them or whatever and try to get them to back on the right track. Um, and then, yeah, we could also, we'd also show any accessibility issues. And there was also, also on a wheelchair. We can send, they could send somebody over to make sure they get into the back door rather than the front door, which has a big step or something like that. Yeah. So we're able to actually handle people as they were coming in much more readily. <laughs> um, and yeah, it makes it a customized experience for everyone. So and I've spoken to both of you too. One thing that I, I love about both of your apps, and I'm in development right now with Pop Sandbox working on a, a, a show that uses On Foot uh, called Search Party. And one of the things that initially attracted me to On Foot was that both of these apps, you can pre-download everything. So right. you don't require data. Which, thinking about accessibility concerns, you know, putting a show in Kingston, I was not willing to tell my entire audience, like, oh, you got to stream for three hours. Right. <laughs> you know, and I think that's another really key element of both of your work is that, you know, it, it, you can pre-download, you don't need data, can exist on multiple kinds of devices. 
Yeah, that was uh, that was a big part. Uh, we so we have a content management system as well, and <clears throat> that's that, that was that's what I said when it's like, oh, if you have Wi-Fi and you have your own site, you can do all these crazy things. You can have a massive app. You can have these huge animated three D models. <laughs> Uh, but when you're just doing self-guided walking tours, <laughs> you kind of just need to keep them small, as yeah. small as possible. Um, so we, yeah, we we did everything we could to try and ramp all of our assets down. I think I mentioned like our our ghost models are really just 2D pictures that always face the camera uh, and they're translucent, so they kind of give off the feel that they're there and real, but they're really just if you got to the side of them, they would disappear. Um, yeah, so there's that, and yeah, as I mentioned, you can pre-download. We we keep our tours try to keep them under 40 megabytes. I think. 50s that's as large as it might go and for accessibility same uh, we did a little bit where I mean we are self-guided walking tours so there's only so much we can do we're definitely not the most wheelchair friendly um, but we have you know we have text for all of our audio there's text you can read you have complete mm -hmm. control of your audio settings uh, unity does have like a colorblind testing thing so you can try and put filters on to see and make sure that your app is works for people who have colorblindness uh, and then we did a lot of user testing so I have people who, who were colorblind come and try our uh, app I had uh, all age groups come and try the app to make sure we actually originally started with much longer walks uh, and then realized that you know a two-hour walking tour on the <laughs> phone is not something people will want to do and they get tired so we had to actually cut our tours down a little bit and we wound up creating a third tour out of all our content because we just they were too big so I'm just curious about what the physical distances are of a walking tour Ours was different every time, so everyone had a slightly different thing. Yeah, so a kilometer or a half a kilometer. Uh, yeah. and, and the other part that I'm, I'm kind of trying to wrap my brain around is how much time someone doing it will spend doing that versus yeah. doing something that's more accessible. Yeah, I mean, I think our apps are a little bit different uh, because yours was much more, you're using the app by yourself to yeah. get an experience of things. Ours was definitely a kind of a sidecar for the real experience, which right. was the theater happening all around you, including when you're on the way to things, there might be like one wandering performers doing things and you're not sure if it's a real performance or just somebody in the street who's doing something weird. Uh, so, but we really specifically tried to make sure that it didn't, that the app is fairly straightforward, it's text. Uh, we've talked about 40, 50 megabytes, ours is like 200K um, for, for all, the, all the data and it can download it right up front. So, because it's mostly text, a few small images. Um, and uh, that means it's kind of innocuous, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't make for a flashy demo, unfortunately, but it's it's kind of fun when you're playing with it. But the um, uh, but one of the things we did make sure is that you always have control over the tempo of things. You can put it away. Uh, it'll say, here's some, some new content for you, but until you tap on that, it's not going to give you more. Mm. Uh, so that, yeah, we were really worried people were going to start you know, crossing the street and, oh, I got a new thing, and then get hit. We, so nobody got hit by a car during our shows. There was a good out of a thousand people, nobody got hit. Uh, so that was good. But yeah, definitely the, the trying to back and forth of the tempo um, and keeping keeping some agency for the users, mm -hmm. uh, the audience. Did you have a voice to it, or no? Everything was It was, everything was this, and yes. it would buzz, it would buzz uh, if you got a new thing coming in. But yeah, um, it was yeah. So because you wanted them to be experiencing what was around them live, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah and yeah. so the the the, the um, in the opening in the in the convening, somebody mentioned uh, that like apps should be like Elijah at a seder. I can't remember exactly what that what, what specifically, yeah, yeah. but you know, it's the empty table, uh, the empty seat at the table where it's. He's kind of the most important person there, but he's also not really there, and it's kind of not really the key focus. So it should be, in, in this case, it was sort of a sidecar. It should be there, but not dominating mm -hmm. the, the thing. Yeah, so we had one other issue that I just wanted to bring up, which is we started out developing an app on a platform called Detour, which is a, an app development company. Yeah, yeah, they got and, of those. And, or, yeah. <laughs> And, and and early on, of course, they wanted content. They were, they, you know, they wanted people to develop content. So we developed two or three, um, two or three pieces on, on that platform, and then they locked everybody out, and mm -hmm. you know, and uh, became a service provider themselves. Yeah. They started developing their own content, and that was their business model going forward: was to develop content for them. So just to say, so now we're, you know, if we develop, we develop it ourselves. Mm -hmm. yeah, so. I think people. Yeah. I just wanted to know um, what your script development process looked like. W were you working with writers? Did you, uh, and then tracking script changes in terms of like feeding that into iterations? Like, was there a lock date for the script? It, it, was, it was a pretty well, because uh, um, nobody really done anything like this before, mm -hmm. definitely. And, and Zupa very much 
uh, come up with an idea and then you're constantly working on the script and the production and everything else all in, in all the way through. Uh, so it's not like it's, we wrote it and now we're going to do it. Uh, and then in this case, definitely, we actually did a really early prototype, just like a web-based version of it, of the software. And um, we then, when write, you know, we had some writers locally and some other ones coming in, uh, we had a bunch of people because there's all sorts of content. Uh, when they arrived, we'd give them a phone and say, put this number in, and then they'd actually go on one of these, they'd actually try it out. And that helped people understand kind of the medium, but it was constantly, yeah, they were iterating on their the, the scripts as we were doing this software, and yeah, people just had to understand what was going on. I mean, even some of the UI features, we originally, early on, for sort of the how, how far or close or far you are, we sort of threw something with stars. So you have dashes and then stars, and the stars fill in a bit more as you get closer. Um, and we thought we'd maybe change that to a progress bar or something else, but by then the writers had sort of used the stars as a metaphor in some of the writing. Like, guide, the stars will guide you. Look to the stars to see you. And it's like, oh, well, okay, now we can. <laughs> now it's already in there, so we can. We can. Um, but then the, and then the, the, the captions and text were constantly being adjusted as well uh, to try to tie things together, and it was definitely a... Um, uh, back and forth. Mm -hmm. It was yeah. a very a huge amount of collaboration for everybody all the way through. Uh, yeah. Ours is a little different, uh, and our, our writing process actually dramatically changed uh, halfway through. Uh, just quickly, though, we were asking about length of tours. Ours are about 1.3 kilometers. Our longest one's 2.2 kilometers, which might be a little much, but it's all down Queen Street, um, mm -hmm. so it's fairly simple. And our app tracks your state, so if you want to stop and get a coffee halfway through, you can turn the app off and come back and just mm -hmm. keep walking. So that's. But uh, just quickly on, the, on, our, on our writing process. Um, so we originally started, we partnered with the Haunted Walks, who are based out of here in Kingston, and we're based out of Toronto and Ottawa, and I used to be a Haunted Walk tour guide back in the day, which that's kind of how we had that um, partnership or had that introduction to them. And so we used them to help us raise financing. So we got them on board as our, as our writers to so give us some credibility. Um, but then as we kind of moved on um, from our Haunted Tours and we started writing these culture tours, we decided to move away from you know doing this partnership, licensing material, revenue sharing agreement with a local tour company. And we just started hiring radio journalists to write research and record their own tours. So we're working with uh, Garvia Bailey, who used to be at CBC and Jazz FM. She wrote our, our West Queen West Hidden Histories tour. And then we, we spoke with Lana Gay from Indie 88 to write a music tour for Spadina. Uh, so we just we started finding local people who were more kind of ingrained in that world and had their own studios and all those kind of things that we need that they could do it for us. So. Curious if there was a, in either for either of you if there were opportunities for uh, the people doing the tours to uh, provide to to create input. I mean, I was thinking of Murmur, uh, and I don't know if you're familiar with Murmur, which was in downtown Toronto. Did you get a phone number on a, on a lamp post? And you, and yeah. You so, from, yeah. can you talk a little bit about what the people on the what they might be able to do? Well, that was actually a key part of our production. Actually, um, was uh, so the, the, the how much time we have. Uh, but the, uh, the the main the main sort of concept of the show was that there had been a uh, a collective in the late '60s who had come up with some kind of a utopian blueprint for the future city, um, and then 50, and they sort of fell apart out of their own divisions and whatever, whatever. Um, and the idea is everyone in the 2018, 50 years later, was going around and trying to sort of reconstruct what happened and what some of these ideals were on various themes and uh, then produce their own blueprint for the future. And so each location had a theme, so it was love, art, um, justice, uh, um, inclusion, all these different, so there's 12, 12 different themes. And each, each performance and each set of clues had something to do with that, that particular theme. Um, and then at the end of the experience as you go through, you know, would say, you know, watch the performance, et cetera. And then afterwards they'll say, so please share your thoughts about inclusion or justice or whatever. And a little thing would pop up and you'd actually be able to type, type in your thoughts. Um, and then that would go back to our server. And at the big finale, we actually had projection screens all over the place, which were showing what people have been writing during the show anonymously. It didn't have the names, but you could actually see the people's feedback through it. And then we actually collected everything into, we updated the app, it's like there's a, mem a memento kind of version of the app which you can download, uh, which includes all of the submitted blueprint from all the different attendees. So there's a lot of reading actually. And some of it's just like 
a little emoji, and other ones people wrote these huge essays <laughs> on their phones during the middle of the show, but it was definitely, there was a lot of, the whole idea was that you can have some things go back and forth. We had a video projection people, we had a special interface where they could copy and paste it into their software, uh, which was kind of fun during the show, basically, and by the time you're finished, stuff's on the wall that somebody had written 20 minutes earlier, which is kind of cool. Um, so yeah. I have a question about the community engagement part of this work with respect to the the locations that you're mapping to, and I, I guess it's partly about the writing process, like does how that impacts the right like when you meet a, a store owner or you uh, talk to somebody who makes a living sitting on a corner, like, and what kind of work you do to, uh, in terms of working with the actual people who are living in the locations that the um, that the theater. Uh, imbibers are sort of seeing as um, actors. Right. I'm curious about that. Uh, we do a lot. Of, uh, we deal a lot with a lot of the buildings and a lot of the like. We we're always looking for partnerships and cross promotional partnerships. So all of the local business improvement authorities, like where our tours are, we try and get in touch with them, and they help us get in touch with stores and locations. And we have the ability to uh, add partners uh, into our app, so we can feature and showcase people. Uh, they'll have a different, basically, icon on the map that's not connected to the tour, but you can click on it and learn more. Like for the Honda Box, for example, we promote their tours and drive you to their website to try and get you to go and take their walking tours. Um, and then uh, we couldn't do our 360 photospheres without our those buildings letting us in. So, uh, And that's kind of the way we do those is we just approach uh, any building and, and ask them, you know, are you interested in promoting our app? We will promote uh, your local business. Uh, we'll also give you VR photo, like we'll take VR photography for you for free that you can put on your website if you'll let us use mm -hmm. those pictures in our app, and that's mm -hmm. and that's how we get all of our part, local partnerships. So. Cool. And, and yeah. So that's awesome, just in terms of the promotional mm -hmm. and sort of uh, upper end. I'm just curious about like the people who yeah. are there, because they're actors, and I'm, I, I'm, this is, it may sound crazy, yeah. but it's not. I'm interested in this, yeah. the, the complexity of that question. Yeah, and uh, I was the software person. I wasn't, I mean, if Alex was here, he'd be able to give you all sorts of stories on all sorts of yeah. things. We had a lot of, you know, there was uh, engagement with things and trying to make sure people were, you know, we had the wandering performers who sometimes you weren't sure if they were a performer or yeah. not. Um, and definitely when, when people were doing the original, like, just private tours when we were getting people introduced to the, to the software mm -hmm. as the writers and stuff, um, it, you kind of felt a bit paranoid because you're never sure if it's yeah. part of the show yeah. or mm -hmm. part of the, and we tried to f bring that feeling through to the thing, but I wasn't really involved in that. There was a, definitely a lot of back and forth. It, we had went through so many different sites, a bunch of them like got cold feet and backed out at the last minute, so there's a, you know, it's, it's always a struggle with getting these, these things organized. Um, and it's bound to affect the writing too, right? Like yeah, exactly. And, backs out, then yeah, and then you got to change, yeah. change. You know, one of them was in an apartment, which was a guest suite in a condo building. And people would be going up to the third floor, going down the hallways, and we had to make sure that people were, you know, the, the people in the building weren't too too disturbed by that. You know, uh, they seemed pretty enthusiastic actually. They were like, "Oh, there's a show going on. This is really cool." Uh, but but definitely it was sort of um, uh, a challenge there, and yeah, and obviously just the people living in. in, in on the streets, it's a it's a tricky balance. So well, I remember I read something that Alex had written in uh, CATR, and it was about he, he refers to it as ambient performance. Yeah, ambience, and you know it's that that kind of tension of like, is this real or is this not? But I wonder also as developers of this, like you kind of have to shed a little bit of control, yeah, yeah. I assume, when you're moving through these spaces. Like, there's only so much that you can do about the world that's going to continue to move around the locations that you're, well, the, you're setting. The, we had five performances in the first two <laughs> absolutely torrential downpours. Um, absolutely, because just complete, like, soaking, but everyone seemed to enjoy themselves <laughs> anyway. But it was definitely kind of like, we all had baggies for everyone to put their phones in, so they, you know. yeah. <laughs> Ours is more, you know, we, we lose buildings, like, yeah. <laughs> uh, we, right before we launched, we, there was a place called Jacob's Hardware, it had been in Toronto for 50, over 50 years, it's like the local shop, and it was a Domino's right before we launched. So we had to go and re-photograph the building, mm -hmm. re-update all the content in our app. Luckily, we can update our content while the app's live because sure, of the yeah. content management system. Uh, and then, yeah, same issue, like Graffiti Alley. I, I know our graffiti writer and the photographer were just down there the other day doing another interview with a graffiti artist, and they realized this, they just tore a building down. It had all this old art on it. Mm -hmm. um, which is great because our app, we have all the photographs. We can commemorate the building and all the art that was there. But it's it's it it hurts us when we're trying to drive you to a location and use pictures to help assist you, and, and there's nothing there. It's like that runs into issues. And we were you were, we were talking about the social multi 
care trying to how you share things and experiences in the app. We had actually looked at you know trying to do more users like oh they could like leave objects here and see uh, what other people had left on site and all these different places. And then we actually ran into an issue because if you're doing a graffiti alley tour and you put digital graffiti on top of somebody else's graffiti, there's some like there's ethic ethical questions there. Um, <laughs> yeah, and it's like and we're trying to work with the graffiti community who is they are notoriously to, like they are very quiet. They don't really want people knowing who they are. And like tagging their wall is very disrespectful. Right. Um, <laughs> so yeah, there's that's the whole thing we're still trying to figure that out. But how repeatable all the work that you put in to create for that show for five performances right. is that material that you've created adaptable more easily to a new piece or do you feel you would be starting from scratch or you have shortcuts now towards well we turned it into a, we, we tried to abstract it into its own platform that can be used for all sorts of things so um, I'm leaving today because I want to be back in Halifax for June 16th which is Bloom's Day uh, which is when James Joyce's Ulysses happens on June 16th, 1904, and people do reenactments and retrace it in Dublin. And I've always wanted to do a Bloom's Day in Halifax because we have a lot of similar architecture and stuff. Um, and so I've adapted some of this to be sort of a do your own Bloom's Day kind of wander around the different locations in Halifax and still fine tuning some of that. But definitely the idea is that we could take this and do it in various places. I mean, the, the writing was specific to specific things in Halifax, but it could be adaptable to other stuff. And the idea it is a platform allowing multiple uses. And, and is that available for download or no? Um, it's not really a download thing. It's more like there's a server-side component content management. The app would be customized in various ways. Um, but definitely, if I have cards, we can talk. <laughs> yeah, definitely, there's uh, it's something we're, we're looking. We're looking into having people do using it for various things. So. Well, in the same way, you know, yeah. Tristan and I were just chatting earlier. I started working with the Pop Sandbox, developing this app for a performance called Search Party, which was, you know, a locative app that brought you to places all around downtown Kingston, and audiences would be prompted to do stuff at these locations. And one of the things that we wanted to to work through was, um, you can probably speak to it better than I can, but like synced up music, so that everybody that was in the app at the same time, if your clock was at the same uh, at the same time as everyone around you, you could be listening to the same music in sync with everybody. And through this conversation, that was something that we needed, now the app has that for other people to offer. Yeah, so yeah. yeah, we were able to build that into our content management system. Uh, and it was like a time-based, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what our developers did, but there, we now have the ability to like launch time-based events uh, through our content management system. So yeah, we can have, if everybody has the same time, they can roughly start listening to things at the same time. We can also reveal like a hidden spot at eight o'clock at night. Right. So when you're yeah. out on the tour, and oh, there's something new here at eight, um, we can do that as well. Uh, yeah, we were, yeah, and Aaron, we were. Yeah, we were definitely trying to think about. <laughs> there's more we should probably do, but that was that was the the, the simple solution we came up with at the time. But. As long as nobody's changed the time on their on yeah. their phone, don't do it. But usually, that's not a problem that much. Mm -hmm. So just so we know, we have about ten minutes left in this conversation. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure if this is the the right venue for this question, but um, okay. I'm really excited about <coughs> using um, an app. Like that's the thing I'm walking away so far. Like I. I'm very excited. <laughs> um, here's the thing. Uh, the show that I want to incorporate this into, my audience um, may or may not have a phone. Mm -hmm. huh. um, right? <laughs> so um, uh, I'm, I'm working with um, people that are long-term and long-term uh, long patients. Um, uh, I'm, I'm hoping to connect with people that literally are um, uh, communities in northern Manitoba that that don't use cell phones because they no. they don't have the internet. <laughs> um, no, really, though, right? But so ha um, I don't want to have to say if you don't have a phone, you can't participate in this show. Um, I know with the work that I do at the schools, you can donate old computers, and schools that need uh, computers can contact this organization, and, and you, you'll get computers. Does anyone do that with phones? Does anyone know? Like, if I have an old phone, is there a place where may and maybe this is a like a question for outside of this conversation? But like, if even if we as artists dumped our old phones into like a box, um, perhaps that box could rotate around for shows to to then make them accessible for for people that don't. Because if, if, if they don't need anything other than just one little download, yeah. 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 Like I don't know. We, we Does anybody know about that? 
making sure that it would work on pretty old devices. Like it's just text. I mean, yours is a bit more. We're the opposite. Heavy. We're yeah. uh, <laughs> um, we don't work on a lot of phones. Yeah, uh, but, but for us, it was sort of an accessibility issue to make sure that no matter if you had a really old, we did have some issues, some headaches with very old Android devices because of some of the location permissions. Uh, the way they do permissions change and it causes a big headache. Um, but um, but yeah, we actually looked into trying to figure. You know, we contacted Rogers and people like that to see if they had. Because I know they recycled them. them. Like yeah. a lot of places, yeah, you bring phones to recycle. Yeah, yeah. 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 the time you take the phone back, yeah, and the rental. Um, and we, we looked into a bunch of things. I know Zupa bought a bunch of iPads for their previous production, the archive of missing things, or they got a. I don't know. Anyway, they have a whole bunch of iPads, but yeah. they weren't they weren't the cellular GPS versions, so we couldn't use them for our show. Oh, right. um, so, uh, but um, definitely was something we were trying to figure out. And yeah, we were looking around. I'm sure there got to be something, but I think. Yeah, partner with a school is another option. I know yeah. we looked at partnering with like a tech program at one of the universities oh, in Toronto. Because right, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. they, they have a whole bunch of them because they have to provide them for their students. Right. Yeah. You have to be really careful and not break them, but uh, yeah. they, they sometimes have that ability for you if you have a connection with them that yeah. you can get access to devices through there. The other thing I might recommend, Angela, is you could post it on Slack, post it on a question on Slack. Mm -hmm. If you wanted to, oh, you know, know, create a network from fold of people, like do you have a phone? Can we connect? Mail it to me or something Absolutely. like that. Maybe post it on Slack and see. I have a big basement, like all of yeah. them and send them <laughs> <laughs> whenever anybody needs them. Pass them around. Yeah. Yeah. Find me for the end of the festival because I actually yeah. have one. You can take one of mine. You can start, yeah. A, yeah, start a digital tool library. Like, True. Yeah, there is some of that. Yeah, there's yeah. definitely some of that in, in Halifax. I, I, I know a bunch of tablets for my show, and I'm like, I wish I'd known that they have the tablets. Yeah, <laughs> you can mail them all to you. Yeah, we. I mean, we had. Um, uh, I know. I you know some friends work in app development. One of the ones in that, and like an app studio, uh, and they definitely have a big library of all sorts of especially Android devices of all different sizes and shapes and you know platforms and things but I don't know if they're really they we did talk to them but they weren't super eager to have their test devices out in the world, you know, the world yeah. you know, right. rained on and dropped and you know <laughs> all that kind of thing so it's a bit tricky yeah um, it's, uh, yeah, it's what they use for a living but yeah it is but yeah ultra phones I think people just sort of trade them in rather than like I don't know. I'm going to change that. Yeah, maybe, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's really yeah. Idea. So we have about five minutes left. I'm wondering if either of you or both of you would like to speak to, like, where you see this going or, you know, like, what the, what the potentials are for this five years in the future. Million dollar budget. Yeah. <laughs> but what are we thinking that these this, this activity, these locative apps can do for live performance in the future? Or what do you hope? Um, well, I'm, I'm hoping it just hope, I'm hoping GPS gets better. Um, that's my big yeah. thing, uh, and it will. I mean, they're constantly Google Maps constantly getting better. They're going to build better G networks that are going to be <laughs> work better for that. Data plans are going to get better in Canada over time, hopefully, and start matching uh, up with what the U.S. has. Uh, <laughs> Rogers just yeah. did the big thing. Yeah, days ago, exactly. Right? Yeah. Um, so. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, the tech's just going to keep moving forward, and the hardest thing is just trying to keep your apps up to date. I find with with the tech that's coming down the pipeline is is the hardest part because uh, they're always kicking you out. Um, they're adding new features that then make your apps not run anymore. But, <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, yeah, there's a, there's, there's, yeah, I think there's a lot of potential like uh, coming out. I feel like this whole sort of thing about having virtual spaces on top of the real world or whatever um, is definitely, you know, we're doing it. Um, this seems to be a thing that's sort of happening. There's a lot of different people sort of approaching it from different directions, and, <coughs> and the, the phone is sort of this great little portal for that kind of thing um, that you take around. It's a very High tech device, but it's also very intimate and personal. It's a, it's a great combination of these things. But, uh, but I think this, these, these, I've always been fascinated by layer, like layering worlds on top of worlds. Uh, the Borges map, the map is the territory is the map or whatever. Uh, it's the kind of thing I'm always interested in, and we can actually do a map that is as big as the thing it's describing by using our phones for that, which is kind of fun. Um, I think it's just going to get more so. Um, People always talk about, oh, we're going to have little like AR Google Glass yeah, yeah. glasses and stuff. I, maybe, but I think the phone actually is kind of a sweet spot in terms of, you know, it doesn't get in the way too much, yeah. but it can allow you to do things. Um, and I mean, maybe maybe we're going to get more sophisticated with some of that, but I think this, the phone's actually great. Right. We're going to get pocket-sized VR glasses that you can throw onto yeah. your phone and then look at and, and then take the them off yeah, and then yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. AR is going to come farther. Like right now, it's all horizontal plane based, but eventually one day, I'm hoping I'm going to be able to the put the GPS. Yeah, yeah that would be nice someday. I want to put something in a window. Would be amazing. Yeah. I want to put a ghost in a window, but I yeah. still can't do that. Um, <laughs>
Yeah, I think the AR is <laughs> going to get better. I know Apple just announced a bunch of new ones where it actually will figure out where things are in depth and put things behind and actually clip your objects properly, which is, I can't imagine the kind of crazy process. That, that you need a, a, newer, a newer model phone. That's not going to be your leftover old ones for that. But um, yeah. yeah, so some of that's going to be improving. And uh, we were working with Nokia Bell Labs experiments on technology, and what they're doing now is disaggregating the cell phone because okay. they're really disturbed by this phenomenon of people being locked into a screen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they, they yeah. feel like they've encouraged a, a inauthentic connection. Mm -hmm. how they put it. So now they're they're talking about a little eye earpiece and right. haptic on the yeah. arm and a little pack. Yeah. Yeah. So, but I mean, Google Glass turned out to be this yeah. whole. You know, fiasco of, yeah. of glass yeah. holes. Yeah. Was the term I was, I think, you know, that you don't know if someone's actually recording you or not, and all that kind of thing. And it was like, Magically. yeah, it was ethically kind of yeah. dodgy, and whether they're watching you. I guess people are saying that people with AirPods, um, and like, I guess in the states, don't take them out even when they're they don't. talking in cafes, so like ordering coffee or whatever. And it's like, yeah. what are you? So you don't know if they're actually listening to you or not. It's like, come on, come on. Like, people, my just, just wears them around the house. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I have a, yeah, it's weird. But anyway, yeah, yeah, I just tried uh, the Bose AR headset, which is basically just spatial audio mm -hmm. uh, headset, but it's just a pair of sunglasses, and they built speakers into mm -hmm. the frame. Mm -hmm. So you don't even, they're not, people aren't even wearing headsets, but they're not listening to you. <laughs> <laughs> it's, really, it's really good, actually. The audio quality was great, but you can still hear the world around you, which is really good. important. And if and I'm that. standing beside you, can I hear your music? Uh, you you would have to, like, lean in and, like, get up okay. there. Any other thoughts? <laughs> final thoughts? Any other final thoughts from YouTube? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I definitely, you, you mentioned uh, staring at the phones. I mean, part of the reason we were excited to build this app we built was that we wanted to get people outside into the world walking around again yeah. with their phones. So mm -hmm. uh, that was very important for us. And we do find, like, people don't just stare at their phone on our app because it's a walking tour and you're staring right. at the building and you're walking with your eyes up and then you get buzzed in your pocket and then you realize you have something right. to do. So. Yeah. Yeah, similar thing. We tried to make it non-intrusive to be a, a sidecar for a performance and so people are out there and people really discovered new new aspects of the city uh they enjoyed being out in it and 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 seeing you know rediscovering new new angles on and that was part of the production as well was about the history of the city and the potential of the city and where it could go but um definitely um it became a a great way to re-experience things in a heightened way rather than just yeah great yeah. Thank you all so much.